we have mm. another new tool to consider, one I hadn't heard of until I saw the talk submission. Okay. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing about it. Mm. Uh, welcome, Alexei. Thank you very much. So. <clears throat> All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Akimov. I'm currently leading the documentation team at Adyen. This is a fintech uh, unicorn in Amsterdam. So I came from Amsterdam yesterday. I really enjoy Brussels here. Uh, the weather in the morning could be a little bit better probably, but yeah, <laughs> I like to be here. And uh, so today I'll be talking about our journey, how we migrated from a wiki-based uh, system to GraphCMS. And before I start, I would like to ask you if anybody is already familiar with GraphCMS. If you know about that, please raise your hand. So one, two, three, three and a half, three and a half, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so then I hope that my talk will be insightful and useful for you. Uh, and anyway, if you have any questions afterwards, you can also ask me if you have time. And if you don't have time, ask me on Twitter or LinkedIn after that. And before I start talking about, sorry. Uh, Okay. Before I start talking about the graph CMS and our experience with that, uh, I want to focus on one very important idea in this case. Because uh, here today we are talking about different tools that we want to use for documentation. To create documentation, maintain documentation, publish, test, a lot of things like that. And when we are looking for these tools, when we are trying to uh, find uh, a perfect tool for us, we are usually thinking about the functionality that we want to have. We have our own requirements, we have our processes in mind, so we really focus on that part. And this way, we pick some tools that best fit and then try also to adjust them and customize them. At the same time, uh, it's important to understand that the tools also define the way how they will be used within our organization in general. Because for instance, if you use Microsoft Word for maintaining your content, it means that all the reviews, all the comments probably will be stored within the document in the review mode. And if you are using Git for storing contents, it will be a very different collaboration uh, way to create uh, and maintain your content and knowledge that you have. So this means that it's not only processes that define the tools, but also the tools uh, really have huge effect on the culture, how we treat documentation in our organizations. Um, okay, this seems not working. And yeah, this is basically the image illustrating it. Uh, then before starting talking about the future uh, with the graph CMS, that how we see it uh, in my organization, I want to also maybe quickly talk about what we had in the past, so when we look at the whole journey. Uh, about five years ago, most of our documentation uh, was distributed and produced as PDF files, and you can imagine that it's difficult to create, difficult to maintain, difficult to keep up to date, uh, difficult to distribute to all your customers to make sure that they are all using the latest version, and difficult to analyze, difficult to give, get any feedback. So obviously, we wanted to uh, have something more usable, more robust, and that's how we migrated from PDF files to Confluence, which is basically the wiki-based system. And uh, Confluence has a variety of plugins, so we were using a lot of plugins on top of that to create an online portal. Uh, also, Confluence provides its own API, and we are trying to automate a lot of things to generate uh, documentation from source code. And we were using Doxygen and Swagger tools for that, and then using Confluence API to generate pages within the documentation portal, and we're also trying to test a lot of things. And it worked pretty nicely, uh, but still we had a feeling that uh, not everything um, is performing in the best way. <coughs> because sometimes we came up with a lot of limitations uh, about versioning of your documentation, about uh, making sure that the content that you have is actually what you will be producing, because Confluence is still a database, it's a black box, and we were always looking for some ideal tools and ideal solutions for us. Um, and if we are thinking about an ideal tool for managing and creating documentation, I want to ask you once again if you have any ideal tool in mind that you would what, to suggest to the audience. <laughs> okay, okay. So I, I'm really happy that you agree with me because uh, we came to the realization that ideal tool simply doesn't exist. 
because what can be ideal in one situation is just not ideal in another situation. And you constantly seek for something new. You constantly try and uh, want to improve, and you think about um, different stages of the development of your organization. And what I see that, for instance, the previous setup with Atlassian Confluence, with Doxygen and uh, Swagger tooling was perfectly uh, working at the previous stage, but now in the current stage of my organization, it just simply does not work. Because what's also happening that uh, what I see uh, that our platform is growing multiple times every year, which means that we need to create documentation for that. And we are still a very small team of technical writers. And we really need to produce a lot of content to be able to update. And um, this means that we want to automate a lot of things just to make sure that we don't spend time on some tedious work and then we just can generate a lot of things. We can test all the documentation that we have and really focus on the writing part, making sure that it's clear, easy to understand, high quality documentation that we produce. Um, then growth also means that we need to support multiple versions. And it doesn't mean that we need to update our documentation every weekend, every day. It also means that we need to make sure that we have multiple versions of our documentation available at the same time. Because if our developers update our platform every week, it means that we also need to have our documentation for the new version available every week. But also there are still some customers who are using our documentation for the previous version because they did not switch to this new version. And there are still also a lot of customers who are still using this uh, from a version from a month from now, from two months from now, and we need to fulfill their expectations as well. Uh, it's really hard to work in this such agile environment and be able to uh, create documentation that be usable for every customer. Uh, then, of course, we were focusing on collaboration and easy contribution and reviewing because, as I mentioned, my team is very small and we really rely on all the knowledge uh, of the people in my organization that can uh, make sure that every uh, piece of information is valid from the development point of view, uh, makes sense from the business point of view, and actually provides a lot of value. So we really try to involve as, much, as many people as possible uh, in making sure that our documentation is of high quality. Then, uh, extensibility is also quite important for us because obviously every tool has its own limits and um, sometimes it uh, means that we want to create maybe some nice interaction and user experience on the website. Sometimes it means that we want to reuse different pieces of information and just generate it in some specific way. Sometimes our product design team can come up with an idea that now these images will work best based on our tests. Uh, for coral bl blind people and all these kind of things we need to incorporate in our documentation because the documentation is not only about the text, it's the product uh, from many points of view. Um, and then things like staged deployment and testing, distribution and performance is obviously important with any tool that you will want to use if it comes down to an um, online uh, portal in this case. So when we were thinking about all this, uh, obviously there are already uh, good solutions and nothing is new uh, here. Uh, so we realized that some concepts as, for instance, Doxas code will perfectly match our requirements. And it means in general that documentation is created in the same way and using the same tools as your developers are using. Then in this case, you are becoming closer to your development team, which means shorter cycle in getting changes to your documentation. And also developers are more willing to contribute to your documentation. They are more involved in the whole process. But also it means that you're probably using Markdown or RST files and then uh, store them in a Git using Git flow in the same way how your developers are using this. And then use something like a static website generator on top of that. So there are obviously some pros and cons of having a Doxus code approach in general. And uh, what we saw that with Doxus code, because all the f uh, content is stored in just plain text and markdown files in our case, we can easily generate everything. We can easily control the quality. We can easily test a lot of things because uh, it's no longer a black box for you. You can get access to it and then you can also create different branches in Git and then you can generate everything from these branches you can test. So all these kind of things is possible now. Uh, and versioning is also very easy with Git. Of course, it depends on your um, branching strategy on this kind of things, but I'm not going to uh, focus on this in my talk. But what we also found uh, to be more difficult is that now we are limiting the collaboration and the way how people within my organization can contribute to our documentation. 
as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not only the processes that define tools, but also tools define the processes. And if we start using something like Git and Markdown files, this means that everybody who will want to suggest a change to your content, uh, maybe update a code example or something like that, they need to know about Git, how to make pull requests. They need to make, uh, have basic understanding maybe of the Markdown format that you have chosen. They need to be familiar with all these kind of things. And um, in general, of course, most of the developers, if they are already using the stack, it's very easy for them. And this will also mean that once you start implementing Docs code, you will be mostly receiving feedback from your developers, which is cool. But at the same time, we will be really missing feedback from a lot of people who are not developers, who are working in technical support and helping with implementations, um, they're representing the product side, business side. And this means that if you are using only this approach, um, then the quality of the feedback that you will be receiving from other people, it will be very minimal. It will be only maybe typos that's in spot or maybe some really small things. And we really didn't want, want to lose that. Um, that's why we started thinking about something that can help us uh, with actually fulfilling these requirements and also making sure that we are creating something that will be useful for us in the next five years at least. And this is how we came up with an idea of having a CMS on top of the Docs code approach. So then it should be a CMS you working with flat files, with Markdown and RST. And this is also not something new. There are already different CMSs uh, doing that. I think one of the most popular is Netlify CMS, maybe. There are other CMSs. I, I, I'm not sure about everything. And when we looked at them, we decided to pick Graph CMS. What's good about Graph CMS uh, in our case is that uh, it's open source. And for us, it was extremely important because we wanted to have a version uh, that we can run in our organization, so not a cloud-based version. Because when you create documentation, it can also happen that in this documentation, there is something sensitive. Probably you don't want to expose it up to the moment when it's ready. Or, so you really need to make sure that all the content and the technologies that you're using is still within your organization. And when it's ready, then you can publish it. Um, also, in this case, it was good for us that it's based in PHP. And it was already a familiar stack for, in my organization. So it, for us, it was clear how to use it, how we can maintain security issues, and how we can develop it and how we can get support from the developers. So this is basically the summary from the Graph CMS website. It's an open source flat file known DB CMS. And they also claim they're focused on being crazy fast and easy to learn and use. You can uh, test it for yourself if you want, but in our experience, it was really easy to set up, easy to use, and uh, it's performing very well on 5,000 pages. So. Uh, for, for us, uh, I would say that it, it was a good choice. And uh, what's also important to know from the technology point of view that GraphCMS is using uh, the dynamic site generator when you edit a page. At the same time, there is another static website generator for GraphCMS. It's called Black Hole, and it's also in PHP. So you still stay in the same stack if you want to expand it and uh, use it in your organization. Um, also, of course, when we're looking for a solution, we uh, we're trying to make sure that this is not something that um, will just stop its development in, in a year. And for GraphCMS, uh, what we can see, uh, the community is huge and it's really growing. Um, I think currently on GitHub, it's about 10K um, favorites uh, for this repository. And in general, if we look at the commits history at the outstanding tickets, uh, we think that the situation is pretty healthy. Uh, and also, if you need some custom integration or some custom implementation, uh, you can get support from Trilby Media who created the CMS and who can also assist you with uh, setting it up in your organization and creating different plugins and themes for that. That's what we are doing. And um, now I want to talk a little bit about the implementation that we got in the result. So here we can see that all the content is stored in Markdown files in a Git repository, which is internal in our case. And uh, then you can edit this content using the 
uh, UI in a CMS, uh, which is um, graph CMS in this case, or using the IDE if you're a developer and if you prefer to use the same tools that you would want to use. And this means basically that technical writers and any other people within your organization who want to collaborate on this content can also contribute to that. And then um, from the Git repository, we can generate a static website using the generator. We can test, and we run tests against the source markdown files and also against the result to make sure that it's uh, passing our quality. And actually, we also have plans to introduce more tests and linting uh, that Sven was talking about, but this is probably uh, sometime later this year. And this is all internal. And external, we can distribute the static website in HTML form and then also use some sort of analytics to see how this content has been used. Um, what's also nice that with Graph CMS you can uh, create plugins and expand different um, functionalities that you, you want. In our case, we created some plugin uh, that allows us to actually see all the reviews and everybody in the organization can submit the change and they just edit any page that they want to edit, or they create, create a new page from scratch. And then a technical writer will be able to review and see, and then maybe approve or disapprove the change or leave some comments. And this is happening not in a Git flow, this is happening in the CMS itself. Currently we are testing this plugin, and I hope that maybe in a month we'll be able also to open source it. <coughs> so during this journey we learned some lessons. I also want to share them with you. First of all, uh, the first lesson, mind your stack. Um, it, it means that, of course, there are different tools, different solutions, but the solution that you will choose in the end, it also really depends on the stack that probably you're already using, and if you have any developers in your organization who can assist you with uh, improving and expanding this, uh, I think this is really important. Of course, it's always nice to learn something new and trendy, but sometimes you just need to stick to the choice that you have now and then you will have the power to improve the solution and to expand it. And um, also another lesson for us is that we can extend markdown when necessary. Uh, in general, especially with graph CMS, you have a lot of flexibility so you can introduce different forms of short codes <laughs> and if you think about uh, different implementations of the content flow and for instance in your content you want to sh show some additional info on the site uh, you want to have a block of different steps at the bottom of the page so you want to introduce some structure with, which is not natural for markdown files but maybe this is something that you would miss from the semantic um, content creation like Dita has so in this case it's still possible with markdown you just extend it and use something like short codes maybe some metadata on top of the page uh, and you just don't need to be afraid of that and don't need to think about your content as fun all the time only because you uh, are missing this opportunity uh, then another lesson that we learned that it's always nice if you have a good proof of concept uh, in our case we decided to first change our internal system because we also have our internal system for knowledge sharing and we migrated from two legacy internal systems to a new one based on graph CMS and on this way we already learned how to use, how to set it up, how to test it and based on this experience it was really easy for us to implement the same process for migrating our external documentation. Um, then another of course lesson that in this case we did not set it up from the ground uh, so it was already a system and uh, with our public documentation and we also need to maintain and update it every day. So it means that we cannot just uh, take our content and then spend a week to move it to a new system and don't receive any updates during this week. Uh, so in this case, when you're doing the migration, it means that you will be repeating this process uh, many times. And if in this process there are some manual steps when sometimes you need to copy files from one folder to another or sometimes you need to ask another guy to run another script or things like that, it never works perfectly. So if you're in a similar situation as we were, I would just recommend you try to automate every step. So it should be only a single button, you do this, you get results and you test the outcome. And for us it was also difficult because we were migrating from Confluence using Confluence API and with some pen doc on top of that and some other scripts. So automation here really helped a lot. Um, another very interesting realization is that problems during migration can be fixed at different levels. Because in our situation, um, when we tried to migrate first, we saw that the outcome is really um, 
complicated and has so many errors and we were trying to improve our migration tool to write more complex scenarios to um, catch all the edge cases and at some moment we just decided that it's also possible to change the contents that we currently have in our case uh, in another system and because technical writers and developers are sitting in the same room and they can just discuss it quickly and solve this on the daily basis every time we see a problem we can make a decision do we need to write some specific code to um, uh, actually solve this case or do we want to fix it in the first place because then it doesn't add a, a lot of value in the content that we had in our, the original system um, sixth lesson is that it's always interesting to learn from users and in this case we also organized some user testing with our internal user just to see how they contribute and this was uh, extremely powerful because we found out that we were expecting them to click on some certain buttons and then some certain label just didn't work because nobody was able to understand this except for technical writers and then after such user tests we just improved the UI and changed a lot of things and now it works best for technical writers and for everybody who can contribute to us and last um, lesson is that everything that we do uh, we are also trying to contribute to the public repository and just open source and this is of course to make sure that the platform that we have chosen just uh, in a good shape and that we can also support its growth uh, but also for us it's just easier to reduce the maintenance costs in the future because if you want to update a new version and we have a lot of custom code written for us then we need to merge it somehow and in this case we just don't need it because it's already open source as part of the system so I think I hope it was useful for you and if you're in a similar situation as we were some time ago also you can reach out to me and ask any questions or we have some time to discuss some things now as well. We have three minutes for questions. <laughs> So in our, in our case, all the content that we distribute is a part of the development portal. And if a developer adds something, then we can also just um, see it in our lock of changes and then we can review it and then, yeah, basically see if it's following our style guide and if it's compliant, then we can just publish it as a part of that. If it's not, then we can discuss with the developer where we want to see this content. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, for me, it's still interesting in all these phases, uh, but I, I would say that in the editing process as well. And its editor uh, is still probably not that rich as Microsoft Word or something like that, but maybe sometimes you just don't need it. Uh, and we are also trying to improve it to fit our needs, but it already has a lot of features, so I would recommend to look at this. That's a very good question. Um, so everything is possible for us. Currently, we are not receiving a lot of requests to do this. Uh, so then if we uh, see that it's still required, then we will need to come up with a solution how to generate it from markdown files. I hope that it's still possible. For instance, in my organization, we also create point of sale terminals, which are distributed in boxes. And with these boxes, probably it makes sense to have some printed documentation. Currently, just all custom made, but because also it's something like in IKEA you need to have good images and it's not so much about writing, it's also about the way how you present and tell the story. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much.